And so uh, if you want to go on a Marie Kondo kick, and if you don't know who she is, then you've been living in a cave for the last <laughs> uh, If you want to go on a Marie Kondo kick, there are lots of places to take stuff to, but a very good place is the City Square thrift shop. And they make a little money with what you do, and they provide uh, garments for people that need them. So uh, just City Square get, uh, thrift shop, Google it, and it will be worth uh, doing. OK, am I ready? I'm reading from an article by the author of this book, Robin D'Angelo. I am white. As an academic consultant and writer on white racial identity and race relations, I speak daily with other white people about the meaning of race in our lives. These conversations are critical because by virtually every measure, racial inequality persists and institutions continue to be overwhelmingly controlled by white people. While most of us see ourselves as not racist, we continue to reproduce racist outcomes and live segregated lives. Um, we have done a number of books here that deal with racism. Books like The Making of a Racist, written by a white professor from a major university who grew up in the South, in Florida, the state I grew up in, and he described how he was raised in a racist family, in a racist environment, and then he started researching. And he discovered the way white slave owners owned enslaved people, sold the children separated from their parents and separated from their siblings, and then discovered the documents that proved that, quote, white supremacy was in fact the reason for the Civil War. And if any of you want to object to that, then I have a reading assignment or two for you. Start with the cornerstone speech by Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederate States of America, and then just read the Texas Ordinance of Secession. And so our country was founded on the premise that black people are intended to be, by the God of the universe, subservient to white people. We've done many other books written by um, Ken, uh, Kendi, I, I'm drawing a blank on his full name, uh, my head is full, I told you, and by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, we've done a lot of books about racism. Uh, this morning, we learned that a Coast Guard lieutenant is a white supremacist and was planning to kill some Democrats and some journalists, and he's been arrested, and, and he was sort of doing it because they want to bring about equality and inclusion in the land. So I want everybody to understand, if you are a white supremacist, and you believe black people deserve to be inferior, you're an overt racist. And, and if you're that kind of person, then I don't know what to say to you except please leave. <laughs> but this book says, and this is really important, when you say to yourself, I'm not that, that doesn't mean you're not racist. And so this is a book by a white woman written to white people. And so if you are a person who is African American, a person of color, uh, th then you're kind of listening in on a conversation from a white woman to white people. She has been a college professor, and she has been hired by major organizations to come in and talk about racism. And it's really a very good book to read, disturbing but good. And so I racked my brain trying to think of what she's saying in this book, and I've come up with an, an illustration that may help us get it. 
on December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for not giving up her seat on the bus. <coughs> the bus was overflowing with white people. That's why she was arrested. And so, here's the question. Why didn't any white people stand next to Rosa Parks and say to the bus driver who was arresting her, you can't do this, this is wrong. And why didn't on November 30, 1955, the white people who sat in the front of the bus say to the black people in the back of the bus, let's just sit together. And why didn't the white people on November 1st, 1955, and November 1st, 1954, and November 1st, 1953, not stand up as a group and say, this is wrong? Let's call that systemic racism. And that's what she is talking about in this book, are all the multitude of ways that white people never spoke up, never spoke out, never take, took a stand, but she's not talking about the 1950s. She's talking about 2018 and 2019. So you really could leave now. I've sort of told you what the book said. <laughs> so the name of the book is White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And if you're on Twitter, let me just encourage you to do a Twitter search for her name, and you're gonna find a panel from Great Britain, and you're gonna see a white man basically look disgusted at her accusations, which sort of prove her accusations. <laughs> so, all right, uh, everybody get ready. We're gonna start on the front, and we're gonna go forward. We've got some extra handouts somewhere. I don't know, does anybody have any extra handouts? Uh, I'll give him mine that's not matched up. So there, you can have that one. All right, here we go. Take it back. Okay. What is the, the full name of the book is White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. What is the point? A white person's discomfort should not be what is at stake in modern discussions of race. Circle that sentence. That's really the point of the book. In other words, if a white person is in a conversation about race and they say, I'm not racist, and don't accuse me of being racist, and I don't see color, every white person, raise your right hand. If you're a white person, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I will never again say, I don't see color. Lying people, you. She says, you can't say that. And, and, and I don't know that I've ever said it, but I will tell you that Howard Schultz just said it in an interview. And so, um, a white person's discomfort should not be what is at stake in a modern discussion of race. The white people are not the ones who have been wrong and are not the ones being wrong. And what happens, and I'm getting ahead of myself, is she says, I go into companies and, and I actually am hired, she says, to talk about racism in the modern world. And I talk about racism in the modern world. And the white people get their feelings hurt. And they say, I'm not racist. She says, you know, and there's one story in the book where a man stood up and said, white men can't get any jobs anymore. <laughs> and the room had 40 employees, 38 white, most of them men. 38 out of 40. And so, so, and, and wait until I get the chapter on white women's tears. <laughs> Holy night. Okay, why is this book worth our time? Number one, this book presents an honest look at the realities of the black experience, though admittedly from a white woman author. Number two, white people who are not racist personally. What I mean by that is in cruel, personal, harmful, overtly racist ways. Flying the Confederate flag, you know, wearing symbols of racism, 
calling even even calling themselves white supremacists, white people who are not racist personally, are still racist in systemic ways. Underline that sentence. They need to become aware of these ways. This book will help. Number three, this is not a time to worry too much, if any, about the hurt, hurting of feelings of white people. White fragility is not worth defending. This book will help with that also. So let's just go ahead and settle the issue. If you are white, you have supported racist systems. Therefore, there is an element that you are racist don't get defensive about it. Understand it. And, and by the way, when I'm saying this as a speaker, I'm pointing to you, but please notice my finger. If you are a white person, you need to be aware that you are doing this. I am doing this. This is the way it is. Okay, what you now have are quotes and excerpts from the book. Michael Eric Dyson wrote the foreword. Go to Barnes & Noble, sit down and read the foreword, and then spend the next week sobbing and repenting. <laughs> Michael Eric Dyson does not mince words. <laughs> All right. One metaphor for race and racism won't do. No, we need many metaphors. Race is a condition, a disease, a card, a plague, an original sin. Whiteness has remained constant. Whiteness is the unchanging variable. Whiteness has been, to pitch Amir, Amiri Baraka's resonant phrase, the changing same, a highly adaptable and fluid force that stays on top, circle that phrase, that stays on top no matter where it lands. In a sense, whiteness is at once the means of dominance, the end to which dominance points, and the point of dominance too, which in its purest form in its greatest fantasy never ends. Whiteness is a fiction. Um, I, I know a white man who got a kidney transplant from a black man, and it worked. <laughs> now let me just remind you of that. Whiteness is a fiction. What in the jargon of the academy is termed a social construct. If I need a transplant, and a black donor matches, I'm ready to take it unless that black donor is a Patriots fan. I'd rather not. <laughs> Whiteness, like race, may not be true, but it is real. Circle that. That's a good line from Michael Eric Dyson. Beyonce Knowles, and by the way, Dyson's a big fan of Beyonce recently remarked, it's been said that racism is so American that when we protect racism, some assume we're protect, when we protest racism, some assume we're protesting America. The flow of white identity into American identity, of racist beliefs into national beliefs, must be met head on with a full-throated insistence that what it means to be American is not what it means to be white, at least not exclusively or even primarily. Uh, there are a lot of people who talk about, let's return America to what it was. What it was was white supremacy and segregation. We need to understand that. And so Robin DiAngelo is the new racial sheriff in town. White fragility is an idea whose time has come. And so that's from the forward. Now, kind of a personal struggle. Um, Reverend Britt is missing today. I'm sorry about that. But, but I've done really, I think, decent jobs on some books dealing with racism. And, and I, I just kind of watched Reverend Britt. For those of you who don't know him, he's an African-American African man. He's a great advocate. And I just kind of watch his body language, and he kind of has this sense of, we black folks already knew all that. <laughs> and, and, and so, what is my role? What is the role of a white person who wants to become woke? 
See, I'm learning new vocabulary. <laughs> and, and the answer is that you never get to be proud of how woke you are if you are white. Let me say that again. You never get to be proud of how woke you are because you are white. Because number one, you're not woke enough. And number two, you still don't know what it was like on the other end of the spectrum. And so, why do I do this? Because I want to learn, I want to progress, but I don't think I could ever understand. Okay, now into the book, and from now on it's her, Robin DiAngelo herself. The United States was founded on the principle that all people are created equal. Yet the nation began with the attempted genocide of indigenous people and the theft of their land. American wealth was built on the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their de descendants. <laughs> women were denied the right to vote until 1920. And black women were denied access to that right until 1965. Circle that and read your history. And one of the major southern states had 2% of black people voting in 1964 and 56% in 1968. That's what the Voting Rights Act did. All right? The term identity politics refers to the focus on the barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. The identities of those sitting at the tables of power in this country have remained remarkably similar, similar while male, white, male, middle and upper class, able-bodied. White men have run the universe in America. End of discussion. And that's it. All right. Number 10. Exclusion by those at the table doesn't depend on willful intent. Circle that phrase. It's not that they necessarily willfully intended that. We don't have to intend to exclude for the results of our actions to be exclusion. While implicit bias is always at play because all humans have bias, inequity can occur simply through homogeneity. If I'm not aware of the barriers you face, then I won't see them, much less be motivated to remove them nor will I be motivated to remove the barriers if they provide an advantage to which I feel entitled. Now this book doesn't do anything with this, but I think you all have heard the story that if you send out identical resumes, and, and one of them is from Susan Smith, and the other one is from Lakeisha Jones, Lakeisha is not invited in for the interview. The name is too black. Identical resumes. And so, so that's the kind of systemic racism that our country has. Number 11, all progress we have made in the realm, realm of civil rights has been accomplished through identity politics, women's suffrage, the American with Disabilities Act, Title IX, federal recognition of same-sex marriage. Not naming the groups that face barriers only serves those who already have access. The assumption is that the access enjoyed by the controlling group is universal. For example, although we are taught that women were granted suffrage in 1920, we ignore the fact that it was white women who received full access of that, or that it was white men who granted it. By the way, that's a fact. White women could vote because white men finally let them. That's what happened. Not until the 1960s through the Voting Rights Act were all women, regardless of race, granted full access to suffrage. Naming who has access and who doesn't guides our efforts in challenging injustice. Number 13, when you see something in bold, I put it in bold. This book is unapologetic, unapologetically rooted in identity politics. I am white. 
and I'm addressing a common white dynamic. When I use the terms us and we, I'm referring to the white collective. Now, I'm not going to be able to read all of these, so we're going to skip some. I encourage you to read all, all of them on your own. Number 15, we can never consider our learning to be complete or finished. Put about 83 stars around it. That's a big one. All right, number 18. In a racist society, the desired direction is always toward whiteness and away from being perceived as a person of color. My wife and I went through the Thomas Jefferson Monticello a slave family exhibit at the African American Museum maybe a month ago. And some of the descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings were able to pass as white. You know what that means? It's better for that person to pass as white as to be black. Why did black people, African Americans, why did people who were black lineage, black family lineage, want to pass as white? Because that gave them a better life. Why? Because of a racist society. And so that's the idea. All right, number 20. White people in North America live in a society that is deeper, deeply separate and unequal by race. And white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. Number 23. For example, many white participants who lived in white suburban neighborhoods and had no sustained relationships with people of color were absolutely certain that they held no racial prejudice or animosity. So she, she gives seminars, and these people who live in all white areas say, we're not racist. Number 25. And the numbers shouldn't all be there, but Microsoft Word doesn't always cooperate with it. <laughs> I can see how we are taught to think about racism only as discreet. I can see how we are taught to think about racism only as discreet acts committed by individual people rather than as a complex interconnected system. I realize that we see ourselves as entitled to and deserving of more than people of color deserve. I saw our investment in a system that serves us. It became clear that if I believe that only bad people who intended to hurt others because of race can ever do so, I would respond with outrage to any suggestion that I was involved in racism. I came to see that the way we are taught to define racism makes it virtually impossible for white people to understand it. Given our racial insulation, coupled with this misinformation, any suggestion that we are complicit in racism is a kind of unwelcome and insulting shock to the system. If, however, I understand racism as a system into which I was socialized, I can receive feedback on my problematic racial patterns as a helpful way to support my learning and growth. Many times I have told the story in here of how somewhere around 1981, I had lunch with the president of Pepperdine University and a professor at the Los Angeles Club. We're talking the 1980s. Ronald Reagan was president. And he said, come up the stairs to the dining room. So I went up the stairs to the dining room, and it was a pretty small dining room. And there were a handful of women with men sitting in there. And I walked up to the concierge or the, the host, and I said, I'm supposed to meet Dr. White for lunch. And he said, oh, you mean the main dining room. And he said, go up those stairs. And I went up those stairs, and the room was about the size of a large aircraft carrier. <laughs> and there were hundreds of people at lunch, not a woman in the room. And not a man stood up and said, we ought to allow women in this room. Now, I don't know what year the Los Angeles Club changed that. I'm assuming they have by now. But, but what happens is that men 
exclude women. White people exclude black people. And as I've told you, the only people you ought to exclude are Patriots fans. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're still on page three, number 33. This book does not attempt to provide the solution to racism, nor does it attempt to prove that racism exists. I start from that premise. Circle that. Racism exists. I start from that premise. Number 40. If your definition of a racist is someone who holds conscious dislike of people because of race, then I agree that it is offensive for me to suggest that you are racist when I don't know you. I also agree that if this is your definition of racism and you are against racism, then you are not racist. I am not using this definition of racism. <laughs> so that's really helpful to understand. All right, turn the page. Um, number 44, this is really interesting. Um, she talks about the history of finding superiority. And so American scientists began searching for the answer to the perceived inferiority of non-Anglo groups. These scientists didn't ask, are blacks and others inferior? They asked, why are blacks? and others inferior. And I'm going to miss where the quote is, but, but they actually did discover that quote, these are the scientists, they discovered back during that era that mongoloids are inferior to people from Japan. Now think about that. Um, I just saw the quote, where is it? Um, there it is, number 48. In 1922, the Supreme Court ruled that the Japanese cannot be legally white because they were scientifically classified as Mongoloid. To justify these contradictory rulings, the court stated that being white was based on the common understanding of the white man. In other words, people already seen as white got to decide who was white. <laughs> All right, number 50, if we look white, we are treated as white in society at large. Number 54, women as a group could not deny men their civil rights. But men as a group could and did deny women their civil rights. Men could do so because they controlled all the institutions. Therefore, the only way women could gain suffrage was for men to grant it to them. Women could not grant suffrage to themselves. Number 59, Racism against people of color doesn't occur in a vacuum. And look at number 60. Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. This version makes a critical distinction because no matter how fantastic a player Robinson was, he simply could not play in the Major Leagues if whites who controlled the institution did not allow it. Were he to walk onto the field before being granted permission by white owners and policymakers, the police would have removed him and the white people would have stood by and left. Him. Number 64. To ignore the fact that one of the oldest republics in the world was erected on a foundation of white supremacy is to cover the sin of national plunder with the sin of national lying. Circle that. The sin of national lying. All right. Um, for those of you who are just curious about such things, the line across the page means nothing. <laughs> um, it, it's a complicated story. You'll notice that after the following highlights after the line, it's got a location number. It's a Kindle app problem. And I don't know how it happened, and I apologize. So we no longer have page numbers. We have Kindle app location numbers. Okay. Um, number 71, of the 50 richest men, people on earth, 29 are American. Of those 29, all are white, and all but two are men. And the two women got their money from men. Lauren Jobs, the widow of, uh, of Steve Jobs and Alice Walton, who is the uh, one of the heirs of the Walton family? 
All right, number 75. Everybody, I should have put this in bold. Circle 75. The early American economy was built on slave labor. The Capitol and the White House were built by slaves. President James K. Polk traded slaves while he was president. Number 78. White people are receptive to my presentations as long as it remains abstract. Shaking my head, I think to myself, you asked me here to help you see your racism, but by God, I'd better not actually help you see your racism. <laughs> All right, turn the page. So I'm gonna wrap this up fairly quickly. Um, here's the definition. White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. I am not racist, is what white people say in her presentations with body language and with words. This is a book for white people. Um, I would like to tell you that because a white woman is saying these words to white people, then white people are saying thank you for saying these words. She is vilified. She is not very popular among the people who are hurt by her directness. Um, there's the uh, table of contents of the book. Let me just say a few things about it. Let's start here. Predict the race of the people at work based on their jobs. Is the CEO more likely to be white or black? Is the custodian more likely to be white or black? Just think about that. She has a section in the book on, she has a list of jobs and she says, what's your thought, black or white? And we all are socialized to think that way. And then, everybody circle this one. This is the big one. It's got a whole chapter. A black woman says to her at a company, I don't want to deal with those white women, woman tears. So here's what happens. And she says it happens over and over. She'll be giving a presentation in a group with some white people and some black people within an organization, a company. And she will get very direct about the ways white people are racist. And a very socially conscious, liberal, progressive white woman will get fragile and start crying at the thought that she's been racist. And then all of the white women in the room go comfort her. <laughs> and the black people who are actually offended are ignored. The problem becomes the feelings of the white woman who discovers she's been racist and now she's crying. And so a black woman said to her when she was, saw her in the hall and said, are you coming into the presentation? She said, no, I just don't think I can deal with those white woman tears. <laughs> and so she wrote about that problem. That was really interesting. Who are we talking about? The non-racist white people who are in fact racist. Because they support, because they did not stand up on the bus, again me, in Montgomery and say this is wrong. This is wrong. Now she does refer to the Southern strategy. If you're not aware of the Southern strategy, uh, this is an actual statement, not from a Democrat, not from a black person, but from Lee Atwater, who was the, the political consultant. He, he actually trained a young Carl Rove, who led the George W. Bush campaign. And, and Lee Atwater said at one time in an interview, you start out in 1954 by saying, N, N, N. By 1968, you can't say N anymore. That hurts you. 
it backfires. So you say stuff like force busing states' rights and all that stuff. And if you want to write down next to that the word dog whistle, the phrase dog whistle, uh, this is where this comes from. If a white conservative says we're against such and such, and it's one of those phrases or something similar, it's a dog whistle signaling people that they are in favor of keeping people apart as much as they can. Look at this and ponder. The groups listed are the most powerful in the country. And so ask yourself, what kind of society produces these numbers? That's the whole point of the book. The 10 richest Americans, 100% white. U.S. Congress, 90% white. That's when she wrote the book. It's a little better now. U.S. Governors, 96% white. Top military advisors, 100% white. President and Vice President, now 100% white. And, and all through our history, except for one president. No Vice Presidents, one president. U.S. House Freedom Caucus, 99% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. People who decide which books we read, 90% white. People who decide which news is covered, 85% white. Teachers, 82% white. Full-time college professors, 84% white. Owners of men professional football teams with a lot of black athletes on them, 97% white. Um, you are sitting here as the, uh, as the recipient of something rare. We choose 12 books a year, and the committee of two is 50% black and 50% white. <laughs> Daryl Britt and Randy Mayu. Okay. And, and by the way, this is an aside, um, this coming Friday, uh, not tomorrow, but the week from tomorrow, I'm presenting a book called The Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson on psychological safety at the First Friday Book Synopsis. I go out of my way to look for business books written by women, and this is a good one. But I will tell you that the business books are predominantly written by white men. So that's a bit All right, page seven. The challenges of the white woman diversity racism trainer, Robin D'Angelo. The audience denies being racist. The audience is fragile. If they're accused of being racist, they quickly make the issue about them. And the audience really is ignorant of history. <coughs> Their personal history of silence in the face of some form of racism, American history, and city history. I mean, cities have structured cities to keep races apart, including and especially Dallas. Here are my six lessons and takeaways. Number one, there is no such thing as reverse racism. When somebody says that, do not let that lie stand. Because racism requires superiority and structural exclusion. White people do not experience such in the United States. Number two, the discrimination, the exclusion, the racism-based superiority is a multi-century reality. It is still everyday reality of people of color. Do not pretend that it is not. Number three, if you are white, do not claim to be colorblind. First, you are not. Second, it does not help. <laughs> Number four, do have gatherings and conversations with people of color. Listen, circle that word, listen. Really, for extended periods of time, listen. And do not ever turn such meetings into meetings about your feelings of fragility. Don't hurt my feelings here. Number five, Okay, if you are white, admit that you are racist. Maybe not intentionally, but you are racist. You have supported and stood silent at the systemic white superiority and racist hierarchies of our culture. Admit it and guard against it. And number six, 
And if you consider yourself an enlightened white person and an ally to people of color, put a big star beside this. Be careful about how you say such things. Be very careful. You're probably not woke enough <coughs> yet. Now, a footnote that's not on the sheet. In this British panel, and she writes about it in the book, she says, I grew up poor. But no matter where I was, even when I finally looked a little less poor, I always looked white. <laughs> Being white opens doors that dark skin does not open. White fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. Hope you found this useful. It is a good book to read. Thank you. Thank you.